Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, Newberry Symposium, Colonial Legacies in the Luso Brazilian World. Uh, it's a pleasure to be, for me to be here back to Newberry. I have my Newberry mug in honor to this symposium. And I would like to start uh, letting you all know that we have uh, uh, an icon on the bottom of your screen where you can uh, choose the language that you prefer, Portuguese or English. Uh, and now we'll have the first words of Daniel Green, and then we'll be back to our panel, to our first panel. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us at this Newberry Library program, Colonial Legacies in the Lusto Brazilian World. I'm Daniel Green, president of the Newberry Library, and it's an honor to welcome you today. This symposium is possible because of the vision and support of Benoni Belli, Consul General of Brazil in Chicago. Shortly after Mr. Belli arrived in Chicago, he visited the Newberry Library, where my colleague Will Hansen showed him a small sampling of our strong collections documenting Portuguese and Brazilian history. The Newberry holds one of the best collections in the United States of rare books, manuscripts, and scholarly research materials related to the history of colonial Brazil. As you'll soon hear from Will Hansen, the collection includes more than 10,000 books, 15,000 pamphlets, and 200 manuscripts focused on Portuguese and Brazilian history from the 16th century through the 19th century. Many of these collections came to the library through William B. Greenlee, a Newberry Library trustee who transferred his Portuguese library to the Newberry in 1937. When Will and I first met Mr. Belly, we also discussed a scholarly symposium on Brazilian colonial history that took place at the Newberry in 1969. The papers from that symposium were published in a book, Colonial Roots of Modern Brazil, issued by the University of California Press in 1973. Colonial Roots of Modern Brazil became an important work in the field, launching the career of a new generation of scholars. As we approached the bicentennial of Brazilian independence, Mr. Belli suggested that the Newberry Library could use its role as a premier research center for the study of Luso-Brazilian history and culture to bring together scholars to revisit the historic 1969 conference in a partnership with the Consulate General of Brazil in Chicago. We are so pleased that Mr. Belli made this suggestion and appreciative of the financial support from the Brazilian consulate that has made this symposium possible. And we're honored today to welcome scholars from the United States and Brazil to present their work. Bringing scholars from across the world together in conversation to learn from each other is central to the Newberry's mission. Funding from the Brazilian consulate also will make possible a future publication of the papers that are being delivered today. We anticipate that book will be available in 2022 or 2023. I also want to thank my Newberry colleagues, Keelan Burke, Mary Hale, and Will Hansen, who have done so much to make this symposium possible today. Even though we cannot all be together in person today, I wanna to emphasize to all who are joining us virtually that the Newberry is open for research and that we welcome research visits from anyone who's interested in exploring our vast collections. Since our founding in 1887, the Newberry has been free and open to all. We're dedicated to providing access to library collections, and we're inspired by the research and new knowledge that emerges from our scholarly community. Please visit the Newberry soon. Enjoy the symposium today, and thank you for joining us. And now I'm happy to introduce my friend Benoni Belli, Consul General of Brazil in Chicago. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Benoni Belli, Consul General of Brazil in Chicago. I would like to start this brief remarks by thanking Daniel Green, uh, the president of Newberry for his uh, partnership and for his kind words. I would also like to thank Will Hansen, Keeling Burke and Mary Hale with the Newberry Library for their support and in the organization of this event. A special thanks to the Brazilian Foreign Ministry's Cultural Department for its general support. I am grateful to our panelists for accepting the invitation to both participate in this symposium and submit an essay for publication in due course. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this event. There are many reasons why this symposium is so meaningful. Back in 69, as Daniel Green has already uh, stressed, the Newberry Library, then led by Lawrence Towner, 
hosted a meeting of specialists on Brazilian colonial history. The results were published in a book in 1973, and it became an instant classic in the field. As we approach the bicentennial of the Brazilian independence, this event could not be timelier. It is important to promote discussions about the Luso Brazilian history, and it is a privilege to do so uh, in partnership with the Newberry, an institution that strongly supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Our independence did not end uh, with the Ipiranga proclamation back in 1822, that was the starting point a process that extends to our days and is projected into the future. That was the inaugural moment, uh, the birth certificate of the country, an event whose importance no one disputes, but it was also a gesture that has been and must, be con must continue to be affirmed and reaffirmed continuously over time as a constant struggle for creation and maintenance of the conditions that allow uh, the country to thrive and prosper. So here we are today, teaming up with the Newberry Library, a premier research center for the study of Luso Brazilian history, to bring together Brazilians and American specialists to revisit that historic 1969 conference, drawing the attention of scholars and the public at large to the Newberry's Brazilian collection and its importance for the understanding of Brazilian history. As the attitude towards the bicentennial of foreign independence must be one of reflection, the symposium is intended to give us a better understanding of the colonial legacies and roots of our uh, independence and our history. After an introduction to the Brazilian collection by Will Hansen that we will, you will hear in a moment, we will have two panels uh, discussing ruptures, continuity and identity and authority, republicanism and rebellion. I am quite confident that this meaningful discussion of our history initiated at the Newberry Library 52 years ago will be further strengthened now, as we also plan to publish the essays discussed today. Following this pathway, we want to celebrate cumulative advances in our history with which each generation is adding. But bearing in mind that the progressive realization of the shared idea of a country demands continuous effort. It is always an open-ended work. No doubt we have reasons to celebrate our history and culture, as well as the ideas of republicanism and liberty inspired by the American Revolution. But also bearing in mind that we still have a long way ahead to build a truly inclusive country and society with opportunities for all. As we begin the countdown to the bicentennial, time has come to take stock of this history made of a plethora of sentiments a trajectory marked by unbearable justice, but uh, such as the slave trade, but also a great achievement, a history of suffering, as well as joy, a country characterized by unequal access to wealth, but also a country proud of its vibrant culture, vast resources, and a resilient and brave people. Looking back to our past, I hope we can re-energize ourselves to learn with past mistakes and value the progress made in a number of areas. This attitude will enable us to celebrate independence as a process in which our best aspirations are still to be realized. I invite you to take uh, part uh, in this debate that should be of all Brazilians and involve also our friends abroad. I am convinced that this is vital in our struggle to build a welcoming, generous, open, tolerant, and successful country in which every Brazilian can fulfill his or her potential and be an integral part of our never ending process of independence. Have an excellent event. Thank you so much for your attention. Welcome everyone to Colonial Legacies in the Luso Brazilian World. We are honored to work with the Brazilian Consulate in Chicago and with all the scholars speaking today. I hope to give you a little more context on the rich related collections at the Newberry that inspired this collaboration. As you already heard from President Green, the Newberry Library holds one of the best collections in the United States of rare books, manuscripts, pamphlets, and scholarly research materials related to the history of colonial Brazil. Our collections for colonial Brazil are particularly important for indigenous peoples and languages, periodicals, bibliographies, and collections of primary source documents, maps and other geographical descriptions, explorers and travelers accounts of Brazil and the social life of Brazilians, and Christian missions and religion. 
Many of these collections came to the Newberry through William B. Greenlee, a Newberry Library trustee who studied Portuguese and Brazilian history in the Edward E. Ayer collection here at the Newberry while collecting books himself. In 1937, Greenlee transferred his Portuguese library to the Newberry and also established an endowment to continue collecting on these topics. The Newberry's Greenlee collection has thus been built into one of the world's finest working libraries of Luso-Brazilian research materials. A few highlights and notable recent additions from our collections related to Brazil may help set the stage for the discussions today and hopefully entice some of you to visit the Newberry to see items in person when you're able. The first item is perhaps the most beautiful early Portuguese image of Brazil in the collection. This is a unique depiction from the Portland World Atlas compiled around 1565 in Lisbon by Sebastião Lopez. The entire atlas has been digitized and is available online. John de la Rie's 1578 History of a Trip to the Land of Brazil, one of the great early European works of exploration in the country, was particularly focused on encounters with indigenous peoples, especially the Tupi peoples, but included great detail about the plants, animals, and music of Brazil as well, as shown in the illustrations here. The illustration shown here is from the 1585 edition. Here is the 1672 life of the Jesuit father, now Saint, Joseph of Anchieta, printed in Lisbon. Of course, Joseph of Anchieta is a singular figure, co-founder of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, but this item points to the richness of the collection for the Jesuit presence in Brazil, along with other documentation of Christian missions and missionaries and their work with indigenous peoples and languages. The Newberry holds 11 volumes of the diaries of Luiz de du Albuquerque, Captain General of the province of Mato Grosso from 1772 to 1789. They document his journey from Rio de Janeiro to Cuiabá, a trip down the Guaparé to Principe de Biera, his journey by river to Bahia, an account of his trip back to Lisbon, correspondence, and much more. Selections from the diaries were published in Brazil in 2014. You're seeing here a page from the Diary of the Journey from Rio de Janeiro to Cuiabá with drawings and maps by Albuquerque. Another interesting manuscript, probably compiled in Minas Gerais around 1779, contains a historical and geographical description of the region and life there during the 18th century. The author describes the geographical location of Minas and a brief history of its settlement, along with 15 tables of statistics listing the salaries of various government and ecclesiastical positions in each town for the year 1778. This is interesting context for the conspiracy that would be discovered in the province a decade later. We have mentioned the thousands of Portuguese and Brazilian pamphlets in the collection, and one of my favorites among those is a group of three handbills printed in Rio de Janeiro in 1822, including two poems or songs entitled Independencia ao Morrer, or Independence or Death. The collection also contains documentation about slavery, marinage, and Afro-Brazilian identity. Here we see Johann Moritz Ruhendas' famous depiction of Capoeira. Travelers' accounts of Brazil are another strength of the collection. The image here is from an extremely rare privately printed work documenting the Prussian prince Henry Guillaume Adalbert's trip in Brazil. The spectacular Atlas volume includes many beautiful images along the Amazon and Xingu rivers, as well as in Rio de Janeiro, such as the nighttime view of Botafogo of the Botafogo neighborhood here. In recent years, we have also added a number of interesting items to the Greenlee collection, which I want to share with you now. Perhaps the most important recent acquisition is a very rare copy of the 1682 first edition of Alexandre de Guzmao's History of the Pilgrim Predestinado and his brother Precito, the first public published work of fiction known to have been written in Brazil. It was acquired jointly with Loyola University of Chicago and has been digitized and made available online. We've also acquired some works with interesting connections to Brazilian independence, such as 18 issues from 1825 to 1827 of this early and short-lived newspaper from Maranhão. A 
Another fascinating work with possible connections to Brazilian identity and independence is this unpublished play dramatizing the life of Viriathus, leader of the Lusitanian people, who resisted the Roman conquest of the Iberian Peninsula in the second century BC. It was written by the Brazilian João Ferreira da Costa e Sampaio, who served as secretary of the Public Treasury Bureau in Rio de Janeiro, likely in the early 19th century. I hope this sample helps set the stage for discussions of colonial legacy, its rebellions and ruptures, continuities and changes, which we are about to hear, and show why the Newberry is interested in hosting such a symposium. Thank you very much for attending today. I will now turn it over to Eliza Garcia, our moderator for today's program. Dr. Garcia is Professor of History at Fluminense Federal University in Brazil. She was a long-term fellow at the Newberry in 2019 and 2020, working on a project titled Gender, Slavery, and Mestizaje, Tupi-Guarani Women During the Conquest of the River Plate Basin in the 16th Century. Well, hi everybody again. Uh, just to remind you that we have these icon on the bottom where you can choose the language that you prefer. Uh, and so I would like to say again that it's a pleasure for me to be here in some way back to Newberry. You know? And it's really a great place to carry out research about Brazil, uh, not only because the collections, but also because the staff and the place itself uh, and the other scholars that you can meet there. You know? Uh, and it's an honor for me to be here today to this kind of second symposium you know, about these colonial legacies in Brazil uh, in this moment where we are kind of close to our you know, bicentennial, what we could celebrate. You know? uh, so some of the questions I think that were discussed in 69 are still you know, uh, in force, are still um, on the minds of the Brazilians and the scholars. Uh, so uh, we will start with this first panel, you know, it's Ruptures, Continuity and Identity. And I will, I will introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, Professor Gabriel Paquet. Uh, he, is, he is a professor at University of Oregon. Uh, and before he taught at Harvard University and at John Hopkins University for almost a decade. Uh, his research focuses on the history of uh, European empires, Portuguese and Spanish history and intellectual history. He is the author of important monographies about these topics, such as Enlightenment, Governance and Reform in Spain and its Empire, 1759 to 1808, Imperial Portugal in the Age of Atlantic Revolutions, the Luso Brazilian Wars. 1770 to 1850, and the European seaborne empires from the Thirty Years' War to the Age of Revolutions. He also edited volumes and critical editions related to his research subjects. So today uh, he will talk with us about the impact and legacies of Brazilian independence in Portugal, 1825 to 1850. So please, Professor Gabriel Paquet. Yes, thank you so much uh, for that incredibly generous introduction. And I just want to say what an honor it is to have been invited by the Brazilian consulate and, of course, the Newberry to participate uh, in this conference. And it's a particular pleasure to participate in this conference, which explicitly acknowledges, as previous speakers have mentioned, the enduring legacy of the 1969 Newberry Library Conference, the results of which were edited by Daryl Alden and published in 1973. And that volume, as previous speakers have already said, uh, brought to light the work of several then junior scholars who would become themselves luminaries within a few years. And one of these is a historian whose scholarship inf has influenced not only my own work immeasurably, but has shaped the contours of the field, Professor Kenneth Maxwell. In 1973, Professor Maxwell published his field defining conflicts and conspiracies about which a good deal could be said, but I prefer here to confine myself to a few words about his magnificent essay published in the volume that emerged from the Newberry Conference, entitled The Generation of the 1790s and the Idea of a Luso-Brazilian Empire. Professor Maxwell's essay demonstrated convincingly 
that while the late 18th century was marked by the first stirrings of resistance to Portuguese rule in Brazil, it was perhaps more notable for the strengthening of bonds between American and European born subjects and the creation of a truly transatlantic governing elite, which was educated at the reformed University of Coimbra and was imbued with fresh ideas about governance and political economy. So while other empires were being torn asunder in the age of revolutions, the Portuguese empire was able for a time to weather the storm. Professor Maxwell's precociously magisterial essay reconstructed the intellectual milieu and gestured at its evolution in the decades before 1820. Independence occurred against the backdrop then of a revivified empire, not a decrepit one in the midst of permanent decline. It is therefore unsurprising that when Brazil's independence occurred, its newfound sovereignty did not preclude intensive interactions with the old metropole, Portugal. Many connections persisted well after formal dominion was declared extinct and recognized in international law. International trade, diplomatic treaties, socioeconomic and legal structures and institutions, dynastic arrangements, religion and culture, ideological solidarity, friendship, kinship ties, and much else survived Brazil's independence. Much could be said, and, and I believe will be said by others at this conference, concerning the legacies of colonialism in Brazil, and, and rightly so. But I would like to devote the remainder of my remarks to the legacies of the Luso-Brazilian empire in Portugal itself. These were legacies that many leading figures in Portugal reluctantly accepted, at least in the first three quarters of the 19th century. But the experience of imperial dismemberment was rarely addressed directly. The silence is striking, in my view, since almost every major Portuguese statesman in the first four decades of the 19th century spent time in Brazil, either as a soldier, an administrator, or in some other capacity. The future Duke uh, da Terceira served as governor of Pará, while the future um, the Duke of Saldanha fought in the Banda Oriental, now Uruguay, and subsequently um, served in Rio Grande do Sul. The men, therefore, that shaped Portuguese politics after Brazil, as it were, were full-fledged servants of the Luso-Brazilian Empire. Their experiences in late colonial Brazil mark their later career trajectories in underappreciated ways. The repercussions of Brazil's independence were at, one, at, were at once myriad as well as multifaceted. I necessarily confine my remarks to two ways in which Portuguese political culture in the second quarter of the 19th century was indelibly marked by the abrupt end of the Luso-Brazilian empire between 1822 and 25. Permit me to begin with constitutionalism and the Portuguese civil war, which took place between 1828 and 1834. An examination of the entwined constitutional cultures in Portugal and Brazil suggests that Brazil's formal independence masked the persistence of connections within the Luso-Atlantic and as well as its potential for reconstitution. The 1826 Portuguese constitution, for example, better, better known as the Carta Constitucional, remained in force except for brief periods and with only slight modification through revisions and additional acts from 1826 until the fall of the Portuguese monarchy in 1910. The Carta, of course, was drawn up by Dom Pedro, uh, Emperor of Brazil in Rio uh, in late April, 1826, almost a year after the treaty by which Portugal recognized Brazil's independence had been signed. The death of his father, Dom João, in March, 1826, left Dom Pedro the undisputed heir to the Portuguese throne. The carta that he confected embodied the spirit of an anti-popular revivified monarchy. It was designed largely to placate the Holy Alliance in Europe and to appease Brazilians wary of their emperor's continued connection to the ex-metropole, Portugal. In Europe, however, it came to be viewed as a, both a threat to royal legitimacy and the rallying cry of Portuguese liberals and their sympathizers abroad. In Portugal, the Carta embodied the assumptions, aspirations, and fears of those who had not fully absorbed or accepted the break represented by Brazilian independence. With its strong resemblance to Brazil's 1824 constitution, the Carta of 1826 portended an eventual, even if distant, reunion of the crowns. While Dom Pedro was motivated primarily by a desire to ensure his dynasty's survival in Portugal, particularly to ensure the acceptance of his daughter as, as a legitimate monarch, his efforts were embraced by many in Portugal, 
who believed that the ex-metropole's independence was imperiled without robust political and economic ties to Brazil. So from this vantage point, the Portuguese Civil War occurring between 1828 and 34 should be conceived against the backdrop of decolonization in which the ambiguity of Brazil's break from Portugal loomed large. The Civil War itself broke out when Dom Miguel, Dom Pedro's younger brother, refused to accept the legit legitimacy of the Carta Constitucional or the marital, marital arrangement to his niece, Dona Maria. This rejection led many of the Carta supporters, the so-called Cartistas, uh, into exile. And they eventually coalesced um, in the Azores from which, uh, from which by 1834, they emerged triumphant with Dona Maria II installed and the Carta as the law of the land. Prior to his abdication of the Brazilian throne in 1831, the pro-Carta Regency assembled from 1829 in the Azores recognized that its success hinged on Dom Pedro. Yet Dom Pedro's centrality to the Civil War's outcome would have seemed far-fetched several years earlier after granting his carta to Portugal and abdicating the Lusitanian throne, the emperor publicly showed little interest in Portugal's predicament before his brother, Dom Miguel's coup d'etat. There were various domestic reasons why Dom Pedro distanced himself from European affairs between 1826 and 31, including mounting levels of lusophobia in Brazil. For their part, the carta supporters expected little aid from Dom Pedro or the Brazilian government. Even as the civil war approached, Few, if any, partisans of the Carta expected the support of its framer. There were several interconnected reasons why the Regency, um, uh, why, the, why the Regency uh, suddenly regarded Dom Pedro as a savior, which are not easy to disentangle. The first and most obvious reason was the emperor's personal connection to what was transpiring, particularly to his daughter, in whose name the regency justified its existence and armed struggle. The second reason was Dom Pedro's status as the head of a sovereign state. Unless Dom Pedro uh, recognized the regency as the legitimate government of Portugal, um, there was little reason to expect that other governments in Europe to do so. Part of the justification for permitting Dom Pedro to nominate members of the Portuguese Regency in 1829 was precisely to secure such formal recognition from Brazil. And the third reason for Dom Pedro's centrality to the liberal cause was his authorship of the Carta. Dom Pedro's right to compose and impose a constitution during his brief tenure in absentia as King of Portugal in 1826 became an essential aspect of the defense of the Carta as well as Dona Maria, whose right to rule was derived directly from it. The recognition of Dom Pedro's Brazilian government was sought by Portuguese exiles for material reasons as well. They sought to obtain funds needed to keep their almost penniless regency afloat. As the fledgling Spanish American republics had less than a decade earlier, the regency plainly understood that international recognition was required to obtain a loan from European financiers. With a loan, uh, the regency would be able to obtain munitions and raise a foreign legion for the, number, um, for the number and resources of the uh, emigrados, as they were known, were too small to mount an invasion of Portugal. So the recognition of the Regency as a legitimate, legitimate government of Portugal would enable Brazil to either bankroll the Regency directly or to serve as a guarantor of its debt and debt service. This arrangement, however, could only be effective if the Regency were recognized first by Brazil and subsequently by other European powers as Portugal's legitimate government. Throughout the year 1830, gaining official diplomatic recognition was the chief aim of the Regency's diplomacy. Recognition, one leading figure hoped, would prefigure robust relations between Brazil and Portugal. He authorized a Portuguese agent to enter into negotiations in 1830 for a permanent and reciprocal defense alliance. Such an alliance would make it incumbent on, uh, upon the Brazilian government to declare war on the usurping government of Portugal, suspend commerce between Dom Miguel's Portugal and Brazil, and finally to supply the Regency with frigates by which it could establish its authority throughout the Azores and take control of Madeira, whose possession would provide the Regency with the resource it lacked. It was unclear why some believed that the Brazilian government would be tempted into such an alliance, except out of altruism, or what concessions the Regency would have, would have to make in order to obtain such favorable terms. 
Yet the Brazilian government never formally recognized the Port Portuguese Regency, a source of immense disappointment and cause for endless complaint among the exiles in the Azores. Dom Pedro did little, even in a private capacity, to furnish the partisans of the Carta stranded in the middle of the Atlantic with inadequate uh, material support. After arriving in Paris following his abdication in 1831, Dom Pedro warmed to the liberal cause. He joined the Regency in the Azores, where he eventually maneuvered to place himself at its head, assuming the title the Duke of Braganza. Um, uh, and some exiled Portuguese liberals were both incredulous and apoplectic. As one put it uh, in uh, the men of 1820, working for the ex-emperor of Brazil to become king of Portugal, who would have predicted it? So even to his staunch supporters, um, Dom Pedro's spasmodic engagement uh, and long stretches of indifferent lethargy were perplexing, his motives opaque. Yet the ex-emperor eventually became semi-palatable to most Portuguese liberals for both strategic as well as ideological reasons, so long as he operated within the limits they imposed. As two pamphleteers noted in sort of jocular fashion, uh, they supported Dom Pedro because he was, quote, a revolutionary in 1820, he gave the Carta to Portugal, he is the father of our queen, and besides, without him, the cause of our puny regency would never stand a chance of gaining a foothold in Portugal. It may be inquired why Dom Pedro hesitated and perseverated, actions that are at odd with his much criticized impetuousness at many other junctures, both political and personal. There are several explanations, most of which relate to the delicate Brazilian political context in which he operated, where the, his continued involvement in Iberian affairs rankled the increasingly vocal nativist party. Certainly, the precarious and destabilized state of Brazil's finances left him without expendable resources. But some of his behavior must be attributed to the steady stream of information he received concerning Portuguese affairs from his advisors. And there was a belief that ultra liberals, in the words of one of his correspondents, were falsely professing love for your majesty, draping themselves in the carta for the nefarious end of reestablishing the infernal 1822 constitution, which of course had been modeled on the Spanish constitution of 1812, the constitution of Cadiz. So beyond a smattering of proclamations and, dispatch and dispatching diplomats to European courts to generate support for his daughter's cause, Don Pedro recused himself from direct action. His involvement in the Portuguese Civil War emerged less from his commitment to his daughter's cause or liberal ideas than his hasty abdication, which left him casting about aimlessly in Europe, bereft of throne and funds. Now there's much more to be said, of course, but what is most important here in my view is that the breakdown of empire was not definitive in the eyes of many Portuguese observers of the late 1820s and early 1830s. It could be reversed, they believe. Thus, debates about Portuguese constitutionalism throughout the 19th century, which came to a head in the Civil War, were shaped by the transatlantic empire's demise and Dom Pedro's unrealized ambition to reunite the two crowns. The political history of 19th century Portugal, therefore, unfolded in the long shadow of imperial breakdown. Now, constitutionalism was not the only way in which uh, Brazil's independence continued to influence Portugal's trajectory or the ways in which the histories of the two states remained connected well after independence. By the late 18th century, as is well known, more than 20,000 Africans were sold into bondage each year in the port of Rio alone. In the 1820s, as, Brazil, as Britain sought to coerce and coax various states into abolishing the slave trade and slavery itself, eventually, um, the number of slaves entering Brazil rose to almost 40,000 per year, numbers that would remain steady throughout the 1830s. Most of these enslaved Africans were taken from Portuguese controlled enclaves, chiefly in what's now modern Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. The breakdown of the Portuguese empire profoundly affected the transatlantic slave pipeline, and yet paradoxically made Portugal and Brazil even more dependent on each other than ever before. Already in the 18th century, Portuguese policymakers believed that Portugal's very existence as an independent state would be imperiled without colonies. With few exports besides wine, cork, and a smattering of others, it imported most of its grain and ran a trade deficit, to say nothing of its small population. Without colonial products to re-export and markets to open to larger powers, it had little leverage in negotiations. With Brazil's independence, many in Portugal feared that it was a matter of time before Spain swallowed up its smaller neighbor. In the late 1820s and 30s then, many in Portugal urged lavishing attention on the remaining derelict and neglected colonies, 
chiefly Mozambique and Angola, with some hoping to convert them into colonies of free, quote unquote, um, white settlement, producing tropical commodities formerly obtained in Brazil. The practical, to say nothing of the moral problem with this vision, was that those colonies had been little more than a depot for convict labor and an entrepot for the slave trade the latter of which was controlled almost entirely by Brazilian slave traders using Brazilian capital. So at the heart of Portuguese schemes for national survival and regeneration after 1825 then, lay a new imperial vision, one which was impeded by the utter reliance on the former colony. Whatever economic vitality Portuguese claimed African territories enjoyed rested upon the profits of the Brazilian slave trade. And many feared that Angola and Mozambique would break with Portugal and join Brazil in a type of South Atlantic confederation. This never came to pass, but Portuguese colonial policy until the final abolition under intense British pressure of the slave trade in 1850 hinged on Brazilian policy and the demands of Brazilian agriculture. In this sense, Portuguese imperial schemes and national regeneration efforts more generally in the 1830s and 40s occurred against the backdrop of Brazilian decolonization. Though in many respects, Brazil's relevance to Portuguese politics faded in the 1840s, the persistence of the slave trade, both Brazil's dependence on it and Portuguese Africa's economic orientation toward it, meant that the histories of Portugal and Brazil would remain entwined until nearly mid-century. The abolition of the slave trade in 1850, then much more than independence in 1822 to 25, was the act that severed Brazil and Portugal from each other definitively. It was from about 1830 that Portuguese political and economic writers, publicists, and public officials began to consider in earnest the notion of harnessing empire to confront the domestic crisis facing Portugal, to alleviate its economic plight while renewing a sense of national purpose. Soon after the Civil War came to an end in 1834, Sada Bandera, the new Secretary of State for Naval and Colonial Affairs, sought to devise a more systematic approach. In the words, of uh, a government publication that he sponsored, quote, it is of the greatest importance to make the public as well acquainted as possible with the colonies. Far too little is known about them. And this lack of familiarity undoubtedly is one of the chief reasons why our colonies have fallen into such a state of decadence. In an 1836 speech, um, Sa argued that the poor state of our colonies is not due solely to bad government, but to the fact that Portugal has devoted its attention almost exclusively to Brazil. He said that uh, essentially that Portugal had failed to exploit, quote, the gold mines, copper, iron, and precious stones of Portugal's African possessions. He argued that in Africa, we can produce the same commodities that we formerly cultivated in Brazil. Now, many more examples and episodes and anecdotes could be offered, but I believe that the test cases of constitutionalism and colonial policy in Portugal after Brazil's independence suggest the extent to which historians should reassess the boundaries separating colonial from national history and to appreciate the legacies which colonialism left not only in the success in successor states like Brazil, but in the metropole in European states like Portugal. In general terms, the end of the Luso-Brazilian empire suggests that terms such as independence, and decolonization, and the age of revolutions can obscure as much as they illuminate, as well as why paying attention to connections after colonialism is a worthwhile enterprise. These examples, episodes, and anecdotes strongly suggest the conclusion that the boundary separating colonial and national history, traditionally based upon international law, that is official diplomatic recognition, is somewhat arbitrary and unsatisfactory. Reunification and reconquest schemes, however far-fetched in theory and unrealized in practice, percolated widely in the looser Brazilian world and exerted significant influence on what are often thought to be post-colonial or national politics. Thus, the line between colony and nation, or in Portugal's case, between imperial and post-imperial power, was much fuzzier and more imprecise than is generally acknowledged. 19th century Portugal, at least in the years after 1825 until about 1850, as I've argued, should be viewed afresh in light of the persistence of connections with Brazil, which impacted Portugal's purportedly post-Brazilian history in multiple areas, from constitutionalism to colonialism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel, for so interesting paper. 
I imagine that many of the audience has some questions. We'll have a Q&A after uh, Professor uh, Pimenta uh, paper, just to let the audience know that uh, if the participants that are in Newberry have questions, they can talk with Keeling and she's uh, at the room in Newberry. Oh. So now let's go to our second speaker, uh, Professor João Paulo Pimenta. Uh, he works at Universidade de São Paulo and uh, is a researcher of the prestigious National Council for Scientific and Technological Development, CNPq. Uh, he uh, was a visiting professor in many universities in Latin America and Spain. His research focuses on the Brazil and Spanish America independence uh, and the building of national states addressing especially the political identities. He is the author of important monographies about these topics, such as Estado e Nação no Fim dos Impérios Ibéricos no Prata, 1808-1828, e A Independência do Brasil e a Experiência Hispano-Americana, 1808-1822. Um, and today he will talk about From Colony to Nation, Political Identities Before, During, and After the Independence of Brazil. Não, Paulo. Bem, boa tarde a todos. Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure and an honor to be here at this symposium. Thank you very much to the entire Newberry team that put this together, as well as the director, Daniel Green, Keeling, Mary, and the Brazilian consul, Benoni Belli. I would like to add that I uh, am very happy to be here with Professor Maxwell, Professor Paquette, Professor uh, Starley and Professor Elisa Garcia. I wrote a full article with lots of details. It's about 17 pages long, but I have compressed that to have it short enough to give a 20 minute presentation. I apologize if I go over this time because I'm going to read slowly in order to not make it very difficult for our interpreters that are translating all this. And this is what I have to say. Collective identities historically constructed forms of identification of the other and of oneself that go beyond the scope of the individual. As such, they are important devices for social organization, stabilization, reproduction. The study of the history of collective identities, therefore, shows the structural dimensions of a given society, while at the same time, they captured the dynamics and transformations experienced by said society. This is because collective identities are always a source of tension and dispute. The goal here today is to prevent an overview of the history of political identities in Brazil in its transition from a colony to a nation or a colony world to a nation world. More specifically, we will discuss the underlying story in this presentation that it's behind the emergence of a Brazilian national identity that did not exist prior to the 19th century. A national identity that was only able to come to existence due to a 
previously existed an original set of collective identities that were transformed by the process of Brazilian independence. So this basic foundation of Brazilians current identity derived from this process of Brazilian independence and it impacts us today with some variations. Second, colonial identities. The Portuguese empire and the Portuguese monarchy experienced a plurality, a simultaneous plurality of regions, peoples, languages, economies, and social and political administrative structures all at once. Between the 15th and the 18th centuries, this plurality was associated with numerous collective identities that were subordinated to a main, a principal identity, the Portuguese nation. In order to be considered Portuguese, two requirements had to be met. The person had to be a subject of the King of Portugal and also a Christian. Grounded in these requirements, the Portuguese identity allowed certain variability. At its core, it was more than just a political identity. It was a monarchic identity that was not only uh, a political, but it was also a social project, a social body of Portuguese projects. The Brazilian uh, Portuguese did not have a whole identity, a full identity. Throughout its existence, the Brazilian Portuguese empire was a collection of territories in which some areas were identified more with other areas, not completely, but to some extent, and all of these different Brazilian territories were connected to Lisbon and the king. In the identity uh, level, there was no Brazilian identity. There was no Brazilian nation. What we had were specific ways of being Portuguese that were typical of Brazil. The Portuguese from Pernambuco was the Pernambucano. The Portuguese from Sao Paulo was the Paulista. The Portuguese from Bahia, the Bahinense, and so on. However, these terms were not the only expression of collective identities. And they were not even the dominant identities, the dominant terms. So a Pernambucano could be referred to as a Portuguese from Pernambuco or a son of Pernambuco or even a son of the land or anything like that. And this was true for all of the other identities that were present at the time. But clearly what I'm making reference to here is to all of those collective identities that were rooted in the Portuguese ma matrix. There were many other identities that although submissive to this matrix, they originated themselves elsewhere. For instance, an indigenous person from a particular tribe that converted to Christianity and whose members, whose tribal members became Portuguese subjects could also be considered Portuguese. But at the same time, they would continue to be connected to their original ethnic cultural group. That is, they would continue to be indigenous. The same principle of plurality of identity could also be applied to Africa, dis African descendants, except for those African descendants that had not been subject, that, ha that had been subject to slavery. And there were other criteria such as gender, 
uh, the type of uh, work that you did, all these could be used as a form of identity. Internal disputes between, uh, conflicts between the Portuguese were recurrent in the history of the empire. They provided a, a great excuse, not only for the mobilization of the specific modalities of Portuguese identity, but also it was a good excuse for the politicization of these specific uh, modalities. A very particular way of being Portuguese was, for example, to defend a project or a political action that conflicted with other projects, other actions taken by other Portuguese. However, no matter how frequent, how comprehensive, or even violent these episodes of uh, defiance or conflict uh, were, these episodes in which uh, the collective identities were politicized and mobilized, these episodes never came close to threatening the Portuguese identity, this Portuguese-Christian subject identity. They never uh, called for the end of monarchy, uh, the break with the metropole, and they didn't contest the legitimacy of the royal power. Invariably, these episodes were basically uh, going against administrators uh, at the colony, and they thought that the king was being betrayed by those bad representatives that were at the colony. In, in these occasions, therefore, the Portuguese identity was not only preserved, but it was in fact reinforced. The scenario it started to change towards the end of the 18th century when protest movements, although based on similar quotidian motivation, let's put it that way, they began to show some novelty, some new features. These novelties were um, content that were political, ideological, conceptual and linguistic that were typical of the so-called age of revolutions, as well as the possibility of a wider, uh, of a broader social spectrum uh, that would normally become involved in political en engagement. So there was an expansion of those that would become engaged in politics. These two Two of the most important movements of this nature in Brazil were the uh, Minas Conspiracy and Professor Maxwell talked specifically about this as one of the most important works on this matter uh, that went from 1788 to 89. And there was also the Bahia Conspiracy, which happened in 1798. The best book about it is by Istvan Jensen. Neither of these movements, however, were successful. Neither of them also attempted to uh, promote independence for the entire country of Brazil. They did not have their eye on becoming a new nation. Both of them, however, did talk about breaking away from uh, the metropole to establish a republic. Again, they talked about this post establishment of a republic, and they did directly contest or defy the royal power. And this in Bahia was clear and evident. At the end of the 18th century, these politic movements of political defiance were also changing themselves because they were clearly uh, able then to foster unusual identity games. These movements were politicizing uh, what, was what was considered traditional colonial identities. And in so doing, they began to represent a threat to the unity of Portuguese identity. 
One of the main statesmen of the Portuguese empire, Rodrigo Sousa Coutinho, noticed that this was happening and he felt that he had to uh, draft an open defense of the Portuguese identity as an instrument of cohesion, of unity, not an instrument of rupture. That is a, an excerpt uh, that Rodrigo Sousa Coutinho uh, produced in which he defends that a Portuguese that was born that was born in every part of the world should consider themselves nothing but exclusively Portuguese. They were Portuguese and nothing else. The uh, political defiance movements of the late 18th century were defeated and their principles were wildly rejected in most, most of the Portuguese empire in the years that would immediately follow them including the independence. Even during the process of independence, those principles were rejected. However, the politicization of identities that these movements promoted, this politicization endured. And this was not uh, so because the same identities uh, would not resurface in the future with similar characteristics because the, the, the world juncture that involved the Portuguese empire and the peculiar position that Brazil had within that contest were going to bring you new opportunities for the politicization of uh, former or older Portuguese identities, as well as to the emergence of new uh, political identities, including non-Portuguese identities. So the path for these changes had been paved. Now, part three, collective identities in the independence. The crisis that befell the Portuguese empire in 1807 began to shape a new situation in terms of collective identities. The profound changes that happened in the relationship between Brazil and Portugal from 1807 up to 1822, these changes were marked by diversification in the identity dynamics that existed until then. The coexistence of several specific modalities of Portuguese identity were becoming increasingly more complex and conflicting and they were accompanied and interacted with political projects that were increasingly more innovative. Overall, one could say that it was this scenario in 1807 and 1822, it was in a scenario that divergences and ruptures were established between the Portuguese from Portugal and the Portuguese from Brazil, and they created the conditions that would eventually allow for the emergence of the Brazilian political identity, which until then did not exist. Many of the important events that we observe in Brazil within this period of time had a central role in the redefinition of identities, the Napoleonic Wars, the alliance between Portugal and Great Britain, the extermination wars, the, the wars that tried to exterminate the Brazilian indigenous population, all this was happening. So all of these events and the fact that the court, the Portuguese court remained in Brazil even after the Napoleonic Wars in 1814, the, all this uh, punctuated the differences in interest between the Portuguese from Brazil, who were benefiting from that situation, and the Portuguese from Portugal, who felt harmed by that situation. At the same time, the traditional association of the Portuguese from Brazil with the American continent, which was already a very important uh, association at colonial times, here in the, in the beginning of the 19th century, was gaining strength. Something else that was very important that happened around this time was the Pernambuco 
uh, revolution. It was a, a revolution that lasted for three months. It was a Republican uh, initiative at the Bra in the Brazilian province that that was defeated, but that incredibly had an incredible politicization, had a profound politicization of collective identities, putting these identities as in opposition to the Portuguese identity. And that was not always the case in the Pernambuco revolution, but many of the revolutionaries of the Pernambuco event identified themselves as non-Portuguese, as they identified themselves as Pernambucanos, and that was of great importance. The polarization of interests between the Portuguese from Brazil and the Portuguese from Portugal they had been you now rising since 1807, reached its peak in the work of the Lisbon courts between 1820 and 1822. The Lisbon courts or cortes were created to, uh, to unify Portuguese across the world, but instead, they just accentuated the differences across these different types of Portuguese. The, the discussions that were um, that took place there got to Brazil, and they were analyzed and basically scrutinized by the local press. The politici politicization of the identities, the collective identities, uh, or the differences between the Portuguese from Brazil and from Portugal, which was getting stronger. went against groups of landowners, of traders, they went against slave owners who started to support a project for the independence of Brazil, which have became formalized between October, which happened between October and December 1822. <laughs> The political break between Brazil and Portugal was therefore supported by this difference between Portuguese identities that had become increasingly accentuated and become increasingly politicized, including the Brazilian identity, which was not yet a national identity, but it was a political Brazilian identity. It did not immediately give rise to the dependence, the, dependence, the dependence of Brazil did not immediately create a national identity to replace the uh, Portuguese identity. So there wasn't a swap. The Brazilian identity that, that surfaced took the, the few first few decades of the 19th century to consolidate. So the Brazilian national identity did not exist prior to the independence of Brazil. The break between Brazil and Portugal was not the result of a nationalist struggle. It did not even involve Brazilian national forces in the making. So the dependence of Brazil, however, it did create the context for the Brazilian political American identity. It allows a lot of the provinces to, a little by little, take those individual provincial identities and turn into a Brazilian identity. And lots of different factors contributed to these changes, the re progressive replacement of the national Portuguese identity for the national Brazilian identity. And now, but I'll repeat, this was a long process that took place from the independence and extended through the first half of the 19th century, the first half of the 19th century. And now I'd like to conclude by saying that um, I want to talk about the future and current I Brazilian identity. There have been many instances in which the Brazilian national identity was partially changed. For instance, during the Triplice Alliance War in the 19th century, during the Canudos War at the end of the 19th century, or during the great conflict or the waves of immigration of 
uh, Europeans to Brazil between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. This international identity was also influenced and changed by Getúlio Vargas' dictatorship starting in 1937. And in the last dictatorship in Brazil between 1964 and 1985, this national identity was constantly reshaped by the literature, by the uh, fine arts, by the music, and by the music of the country. However, this national identity never left behind its original morphology. It never proposed a new nation. It never uh, fought for, never proposed new symbols, a new country. This national identity has always been a slight variation around a particular theme, a theme that was constructed in this process, starting the process of independence. To conclude, currently, the boom of political movements that are strongly rooted in identities, so uh, anti-racism movements, movements pro women's right, pro affirmative sexual diversity, movements that seek recognition of the original people, peoples, all these, this proliferation of identity political movements and their insertion in a national and even global uh, uh, juncture, junctures that are marked by depolarization of political positions in many aspects of social reality. This boom of identity political movements. So it's a phenomenon that must be highlighted. And I want to conclude with that. The renewal of the frequent disputes surrounding the Brazilian national identity, uh, these disputes we find forms and content that is innovative. You have symbols, pasts, characters, you have projects for a more inno innovative problems for the future. All of this new content that is basically measuring forces with other more traditional and well-established contents within the Brazilian national and historical identity. In many cases, these innovative contents uh, converge to some of those original elements that have always been associated with the Brazilian national identity since it emerged in the early, you know, first few decades of the 19th century. Many examples of this uh, can be given. Uh, and I'm going to end here. I apologize if I went beyond my allocated time, but I was trying to speak as clearly and as, as slowly as possible to aid my interpreters. Thank you so much, João Paulo, for so interesting paper. I have many comments and questions, but let's hear first from our audience. Now let's see if someone has questions. Kilin, do you have some questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, not yet. Um, these technological things, they are a bit challenging now, but probably the questions are coming. Uh, so I would like to make some comments. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's comment and a question, uh, maybe in some direction from both of you because you are both like not only uh, Portuguese scholars, but Iberian scholars now. And I have an impression that this is something really different uh, from what uh, happened on the first uh, colloquium in 69. Now, so like uh, scholarship of Brazil, about Brazil is now much less isolated than it was before. Now. 
so I would like to ask you all to maybe um, uh, share with us uh, how this Iberian approach you now helps uh, your uh, understanding about your topics. You now, um, and uh, also ask uh, particularly to João Paulo. Um, a question that I'm curious about, but also because I'm Brazilian too, you no? Know? Uh, it was amazing how you showed the, uh, how the Brazilian identity was born, the conflicts and the challenge you have nowadays. Uh, but I also feel that uh, the way the others see Brazilians, you no, know, is also something really important for our identity, you no? Know? We have some, like some months ago, uh, one month, it was like really recent, the Brazilian, the Argentinian president, now he said that the Brazilian came from the jungle and the Argentinians came from the boats. Now, um, and this is something really, this is difficult for the Brazilians. Now, so if you can talk a bit more from this Spanish American perspective, you know, how they see the Brazilians, in how the Brazilians understand that and sometimes fight with that. Now I think it's an important uh, maybe uh, element to understand these identities. Uh, I will let you answer and then I will put the, the questions that are arriving here on our chat. Well, perhaps um, I might just venture a few thoughts because I think uh, uh, João Paulo will be much better equipped to, to speak to some of the some of the topics. But looking historiographically, you know, since since the 1969 conference, um, I think it's it's hard to believe now. Obviously, you know, with with hindsight. But um, when you look at one of the great works of the mid 20th century, um, for example, R. R. Palmer's Age of Democratic Revolutions. Um, in spite of the two volumes, uh, only two pages were devoted to the Spanish uh, and, and, and Portuguese, this, the solution of the Spanish and Portuguese empires, and barely a sentence on, um, on Haiti, on Saint-Domingue and the revolution there. Obviously, our, our view has completely shifted. Um, and uh, I think before, in spite of you know, the, the high quality of, of those works in many respects, um, oftentimes there was a sense that uh, at least in Anglophone historiography, but I think perhaps even in European continental historiography as well, um, that uh, Spanish and Portuguese America uh, were, you know, were at the end of the 18th century and early 19th century uh, benighted places and that their processes of independence were entirely derivative, copies of what occurred in Anglophone North, or British North America and also in France. Now, I think we have a very different understanding of that. Uh, you know, And I think in some ways, uh, uh, Ken Maxwell's work was at the forefront and sort of helping us understand actually the cosmopolitanism um, that, uh, that, that characterized the Luso-Brazilian world. And I think we understand something similar, you know, for the Spanish American uh, world as well. So our view has completely changed. And I think uh, one of the wonderful things, and I say this as someone who uh, was originally, you know, went to university in the United States and then ended up going to Britain, is just sort of the, the ways in which transnational currents, uh, new uh, sort of exciting historiographies have enlivened uh, and, and made very exciting uh, the, the historiographies of this period uh, in languages other than English, particularly you know, Portuguese and Spanish. So we live in a very different moment and a very sort of exciting moment. And um, João, João Paulo has been you know, an important part of that revaluation. So those are kind of my thoughts, views kind of from, from North America, as it were. Um, uh, but João Paulo, I'd love for you to you know respond uh, to to some of Elisa's other other points. Thank you so much, uh, João Paulo. Elisa, eu posso acrescentar também. Elisa, could I just add uh, the question that has gotten to me via chat? Of could course. I add that? Oh, please. Uh huh. I sorry, I will turn uh, yeah. into Portuguese. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elisa, for your questions. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. The first, the first issue is that the Iberian approach has always been super important for me, not only on collective studies studies <clears throat> for the transition 
into the colonial uh, world, but for my study of history in general, I've always learned a lot from Latin American history historians and specifically for identities, I would say that these inspirations and some of what has but some of the things that I've learned insights that I've had about Latin America that have allowed me that basically I have three. First, the the previous lack in in American nations in within uh, 16, 17 and 18 centuries. Now this could seem so obvious for scholars gathered here, but for a student starting to devote himself to these questions, it was it was super important. And the same thing happens in Latin America and Brazil. Second topic is this plural, plural, plurality of colonial worlds, not only for Portugal, Spain, uh, the French Empire, other colonial regions in the modern age. And last, the most recent to me, and it's been about 15 years, was the possibility of drawing connections between the Portuguese world and the Iberian world related to the American identity. So the American identity kind of prepared the, the terrain for the Brazilian identity. Now, you also ask about external identities pertaining to Brazil, these visions that one has about Brazil in different places of the world throughout throughout history. Um, Alberto Fernandez, um, the situation was clearly a mistake of a president who's not a historian, and he tried to recall this literary situation from memory, and that had quite a negative impact because there are already identity games between Brazil and the world that made this particular interpretation be poorly seen. I do not believe that there was malice. However, I think this was a lapse that found fertile ground for a lot of stereotypes. This is really, really important that always needs to be taken into consideration for Brazilian national identity. Um, Daniel, your, your question was excellent. It's really hard to study the worldviews according to generations. Throughout history, generations end up adopting worldviews that are different. And this is very important for Brazilian national identity for uh, 17, 20, and 21 centuries. This is really important for us today, for our situation, for our current situation. There are clear differences, generational, that pertain about how older and younger people understand national Brazilian identity, and for example, older people identify this identity with his traditional historical contexts. Younger people try and see this national identity related to these insights that I've that I've told you about. And this is but one example that reinforces General, generational differences that make up our identity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, João Paulo. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Uh, so I will uh, put this uh, the question from uh, Laura McKinney to uh, Gabriel. It's here in the chat. Would you like me to read it? I don't know if you read it already. Uh, I had the opportunity to read it. Um, would you like to read it? Should I read it just for the benefit of everyone in okay. the audience? Uh -huh. Okay. 
Um, so uh, the question was for me is that, that uh, you talked about the blurry lines between colonial and post-colonial in the Portuguese and Brazilian context. Do you think we need a new periodization, a new language to talk about what is post? Uh, this is a question historians of war asking about how we periodize conflicts. Uh, uh, really outstanding question. Thank you for it. Um, I'll venture a few thoughts just because our time is, is short. I think the first is that it's extremely important to historicize periodization um, and also to recognize that we are heirs to certain periodizations, which can you know, have uh, somewhat sort of tyrannical effects um, uh, if, if applied in too mechanical a way. Uh, so, for example, when we think about the age of revolutions, um, that periodization um, had a very different uh, chronology in mind um, than I think the one that's suitable for uh, the Ibero-Atlantic uh, empires, obviously emphasizing 1776 um, until the end of the Napoleonic Wars uh, and then sort of skipping ahead to 1848. Now, while I think it's a useful exercise to try to insert um, the Ibero-Atlantic, uh, the solution of the Ibero-Atlantic empires into that framework for the purposes of actually having, you know, productive conversations with colleagues who are working outside of, you know, our own specialisms. I, I think that there can be, in some cases, the danger of trying to contort our own subjects in such a way to sort of meet uh, the requirements of periodizations with which we may not agree um, and that are not particularly suitable for our subjects. Um, so I think that can lead to some, you know, overemphasis um, and sort of underemphasis, depending on the case. And I've tried to suggest how um, essentially this sort of history of uh, dreams and aspirations for the reunification of the Luso Brazilian Empire have largely been um, left out of, of, of the story. But of course, there's much more that you know that that could be said along those lines. But you know, the importance I would just reiterate of historicizing periodization. Um, uh, recognizing sort of the, the, the genealogies uh, and uh, trying to find ways when necessary to circumvent them. Um, but thank you for the question. I think it's really important. Thank you, Gabriel. So we'll have to end this uh, panel now because we we'll have a panel too now coming soon. We need a break for a coffee now. So just uh, thank you everybody uh, and say to the audience that we will pass to the speakers some questions that may are uh, here in the chat and we didn't have time to put to them. So uh, let's have a break and see you all at uh, 3.40. Hi, everybody again. We are back to the second panel of our symposium. Uh, our The second panel is called Portuguese Authority, uh, Republicanism and Rebellion. And we'll start with Professor Eloisa Starling, uh, who works at Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais and is a researcher of the prestigious National Council for Scientific and Technological Development, CNPq. Uh, her research focuses on democracy and republicanism from colonial times to the present. She is author of important books and edited volumes such as Ser Republicano no Brasil Colônia, Brasil Uma Biografia, and Dicionário da República. She also addresses the public history and has collaborated with many publishing houses. Today, she will talk about Republican ideas in the age of independence. Eloisa, welcome. Muito obrigada, Elisa. Thank you, Elisa. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Great. It is a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this event. It's a great honor to be here and to be here in a day like today, where João is here, Gabriel is here, and in particular, uh, the greatest specialist in uh, Minas Confederacy, which is uh, Professor Maxwell, who is a reference for all Brazilians. It's a great honor to be here in his presence. Thank you, Elisa. I'd like to begin uh, talking about the Republican ideas during the independence. I'd like to begin by telling you a story about a book, a small book, not even bigger than a, a um, hardcover notebook, and that is very easily concealed uh, from a nosy authorities, Portuguese authorities. The book was published in 1787 in French, which was the international language at the time. 
this addition had relied on the discreet support of the French government, uh, who was interested at the time in undermining Great Britain by uh, defeating uh, the, America, uh, the English in the American Revolutionary War. And I I'm feeling very emotional. I'm sorry that I'm um, uh, stuttering. And the book was called Compilation of Constitutional Laws of the United States of America. In June 1788, two copies of this book were surreptitiously brought to Rio de Janeiro. They had been hidden in the luggage of a pair of students. Uh, one of them was Jose Alves Maciel and the other Jose Pereira Ribeiro. They were coming back to Brazil after completing their education in Coimbra. In Rio de Janeiro, Alves Maciel met Tiradentes, an important character in the Minas conspiracy. They, they knew each other, they had come to know each other through Tiradentes' commander, Francisco de Paula Félix de Andrade, because Maciel and, uh, was uh, his brother-in-law. They developed an instant kinship based on their shared interests, and Maciel did not hesitate but to explain the importance of the book to Tiradentes and the conspiracy, and he lent that book to his friend. This book is of extreme importance because it sheds light in a potential future uh, for the for the, for the uh, uh, province. What is a republic? What do we need to do to get there? The, this content of this book was deadly for the regime because it had all the founding constitutional documents of the uh, Republic of the United States of America, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution of the 13 uh, colonies from the Republic, among other separate documents. This set of documents introduced anyone to what would be a catalog of rights and the path to develop a framework of a government for the republic it discussed how to establish the, establish the republic in a large territory of continental proportions because at the time the proposal was too ambitious uh, in scale to capture the political imagination of those times because up to then the implementation of the republic was only considered visible in small territories in May 1789, days after, days before they were arrested, Chirac Dentes, who was certain he was being followed by uh, Luiz Vasconcelos de Souza, the vice president of Brazil, Chirac Dentes gave that book to one of his subordinates, in this case, Francisco Xavier Machado, who was to deliver to uh, the conspirators, to Vila Rica, to De Ouro Preto, uh, most likely to Claudio Manuel da Costa and or Tomás Antonio Gonzaga. The copy did not get to where it was intended to and ended up in the hands of the Viscount of Barbacena. And he is very concerned when he finds the book. He starts an investigation that is separate from the Davasa in Minas. He is scared by the number of revolutionary documents that make those principles and rights accessible to everyone. And I think to myself, he must have asked himself, how did that book, an illegal book, potentially inflammatory, could have the interpreter no longer hears the speaker. Okay, so we are back with uh, Professor Eloisa. So now let's continue from where we stop. My apologies. Let's see if we can find out what happened to the second copy of that book. All we know is that it made it to the Villa Rica, and then we have no more clues. It is possible that the fate of this book was similar to the other papers and documents that were destroyed after we found out about the conspiracy, or not. Maybe the story didn't go exactly like that, and the copy was delivered, maybe by Manuel Acosta or some of his friends, people that were not very well known in the conspiracy. So we don't know what happened. But something different from what we know must have happened to this book. Because nearly 30 years later, at the defeat of, after the defeat of the Minas conspiracy, an identical book then to go to the second copy, resurfaced in his CFIC, 
it enthralled the members of the professional revolutionary government in the heyday of the Benabuco revolt of 1817. Of course, it could have surfaced from anywhere. The success, success of the American Republic's experience gave meaning and provided a political structure to that desire of Pernambuco to become autonomous. The book described to the Confederacy Republic, to those revolutionaries, the constitutional project and the government structure for a Confederacy Republic, which met the interests of the revolutionaries from Pernambuco. However, no one knows exactly how the book showed up there. And the story does not end there. Around that time, his Sithi, at the same time, was another character that was coming from Minas Gerais. He was Luis Fosso de Bustamante. He was around 60 years old at the time. He was born in Villa Rica. And what was mentioned in the revolutionary circles of Recife was that he had been part marginally of the Minas conspiracy. And that is possible because Bustamante was a contemporary of Alvas Mavirus Maciel and José Ferreira Ribeiro in Coimbra. And he left Minas very suddenly, soon after the, big, the repression began in 1789. So it's sometime between Tiradentes being uh, arrested and the Viceroy troops arrived in Villa Rica. It's possible that Bustamante must have, con must have concluded that they would uh, connect him to the uh, conspiracy. So he goes first to Rio and then completely disappears until he resurfaces in 1817 in Recife fired up and armed up with a blunderbuss and uh, commanding the battles that led to the conquest of Fort Broome in Recife, where Governor Caetano Pinto de Miranda Montenegro had taken refuge. He was one of the eight signatories of the rendition of the Portuguese government in 1817. He was a member of the Republican government that had been newly created, and he becomes very prominent among the activists of the revolution of 1817. When the revolutionaries were defeated in Pernambuco, followed by the you know Crown's um, score settling, Bustamante must have thought, okay, I, I can't escape from this one again. And his name was actually added, it was listed as an outlaw. So we were, I'm sure he was sure he was gonna be uh, arrested imminently, but before that happened, he managed to disappear yet again. And from then on, he must have figured out that he was taking risks that were too high and ended up leaving with his sons to the United States. Of course, all this could also have been many coincidence, but while the concomitant resurfacy of both the book and Bustamante in his seat in 1817 show that at the very least, how this notion of Republic was being disseminated in the colony and they were making new and expected networks. Minas and Pernambuco were bursting with information about the constitutional innovations that had been uh, produced by the American republicanism during the Confederation period because of a similar system, but of a transatlantic, transatlantic interaction that involved Brazil, North American Europe between 1776 and 1824 and the compilation of constitutional laws of the United States of America was one of the most important means for diffusion of this information. By the end of the 18th century, the term republic had become meaningful and very important for those living in the colony. It expressed what they were thinking uh, about what they were doing and the values and expectations they shared in their um, public behavior. Above all, the term republic also accentuated the meanings and the, the potentialities of the ideas of freedom that were going around at that time, also uh, creating a goal for the logic of revolutionary political action. The vocabulary of public life was expanded at the time to repurposed uh, words such as a homeland, America, corruption, freedom, good government, and common good. An unprecedented kind of recombination gained traction between the text written by the settlers and the actions and forms of political action that were being politicized in the 
three conspiracies in Minas, Rio de Janeiro, and Salvador. The first feature of freedom that the settlers um, unraveled in Brazil with a new understanding of republic was the idea of sovereignty. This meant to them the disposition of creating their own laws and decide their own fate. This perception of sovereignty is sparked Minas, the Minas Conspiracy, which was one of the most important anti-colonial movements in Portuguese American terms of ideas. It was also the first to adapt a clearly Republican project to the colony. This uh, um, conspiracy, as well, Maxwell uh, mentioned in one of his uh, articles, we forget that it happened before the French Revolution. The two conspiracies that happened in Brazil in the 1790s, one in Rio in 1794, and the other in Salvador in 1798, they expanded the meaning of the term republic to associate it more strongly in Brazil. We were not Brazilian yet, but in Portuguese America, we learned what democracy is for the republic. In the conspiracy of Rio de Janeiro, the idea of democracy was used for the first time in conjunction with uh, republic. At that time, it meant the way in which people could organize themselves as equals in spaces that were created specifically to allow them to ponder their affairs and subsequently decide on the course of action they would take. This idea that common people could govern themselves, organizing forums or assemblies that were created specifically for that person was something that was very close to the meaning that we today attribute to democracy. And it included in the conspiracy of Rio de Janeiro, the creation of institutions tailored to allow people to decide as equals how they intended to live together. But the most spectacular moment of the association between the concepts of democracy and republic at the end of the seventh of the 1798 was the, that the, the uh, conspirators defend an ideal of uh, egalitarian principles that showed the features of French Jacobinism. The Bahia conspiracy, the, the conspirators of Bahia incorporated the power to legislate and they wanted to transform into active participants in public matters those three poor men, criollos and mulatos, enslaved blacks or freeze blacks. They organize themselves on the streets and award their and were after their own political leadership. Then on the 3rd of March of 1817, this Republic was established in Brazil in Recife. In May 3rd, you had the Republic of Carato in Ceará. At the center of the events that led to the independence of Brazil, there was a development of a alternative project of political emancipation that was championed by Pernambuco and conceived in provinces in which the local elites aspire to be autonomous to escape from the controlling powers of both Lisbon and Rio de Janeiro. A great Brazilian historian, Evaldo Cabral de Mello, called that this cycle of revolutions the other independence. Prior to rupture with Lisbon, 1822, uh, Pernambuco initiated this revolutionary cycle, like I said, in March 1817. The program sustained um, uh, sustained by liber as a libertarian, federalist, and republican, and it wanted to have provincial self-government. The province then rejects the project of the Brazilian Empire, which was spearheaded by the court that was settled in Rio, with a long sequence of political events that had a somewhat local nature. And this uh, cycle extends into about 1824, when Pernambuco, again, fly its own flag and it's imbued with this, all these notions of republicanism and uh, federalism that will become the Republic of Ecuador. So they start the, the, the news republic and invite its neighbors, Piauí, Ceará, Rio de Janeiro, Lagoa, Sejim, Paraíba, to join them. Uh, the 1817 revolution inaugurated the, the revolutionary cycle of the independence and it incites a stripe of political sociability that was developed by horizontal relationships of reciprocity, and it was sustained by patriotism, as it was used in the app at the time. 
uh, in the a, a patriot in Hesifi uh, meant someone who was admitting that there was a clear possibility of reconciling the existence of a native and ancestral territory where you were born, while at the same time acknowledging that the coexistence between men demands the development of a specific way of living a common culture. Today, we would say that to be patriotic in Recife means meant to be a citizen. You, you, you would benefit from a militant egalitarianism across people who had similar mindsets. You could participate in public debates. And, you would not you would stand out among your equals and at the same time you would also not be anonymous in the public arena the development of a republican language that starts at the end of 18th century and, and remains for the first few decades of the 19th century this language review a lot about the political circles and distribution of power in brazil the ideas that were not solid structure thought they they did not have a dense, authentic, or defined formulation on either side of the Atlantic, not when they were produced in Europe or in the British colonies in the US, in the America, and neither when they were imported and adapted to uh, Portuguese America, Rio, Minas, Salvador, Recife. They, they were the, those ideas that were here, the it's idea of republic, they were not impoverished versions of those, but they were not strictly original formulations either. You don't have a passive import, we don't have a complete copy. And a, a lot of people that were in a colonial position simply looked at the repertoire of Republican tradition that was being built. In, the, in, in, in America and also in France, and they created tools, intellectual political tools that could be mobilized, selected, refashioned, and applied according to their possibilities. So they would have some meaning and could explain it and intervene the, the juncture in which we were living, which was a foundation to the uh, independence project. It is certain that the victorious project of independence that is at the core of the Brazilian state was excessively centralized and strongly conservative. It preserved slavery, it preserved the monarchy and the minority domination. However, the other independence project had uh, a, an open Republican language, open to, the, to federalism, to autonomy, and to the idea of egalitarianism. Even though the debate of equal, about equality was very limited in a society because we're not considering an anti-slavery movement. This Republican language towards the end of the 18th century and the Brazilian independence, you know, those were the years that preceded the independence, they tell a story of an idea of a country that was still struggling to become a reality back in the distance 19th century. It is a story that might have something to say about our contemporary issues in Brazil today. Brazil is currently going through an unprecedented crisis. The president in Brazil is dark. There is a real risk that our democracy may collapse to summon the strength of history, which bestow permanency to human actions in order to show where Republican democratic roots I wrote in Brazil will most certainly teach us a lot about the Brazilians that we once were. And perhaps it might help us figure out in what Brazil we want to live uh, today. And what kind of Brazilians we hope to be in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eloisa, for this really interesting paper. And again, I have comments and questions, but I will wait. Oh, but if the audience has comments or questions, they can be uh, made to Kaylin or uh, direct on our Q&A. So uh, let me introduce our uh, second uh, speaker uh, of this uh, panel. Uh, which is uh, Professor Kenneth Maxwell, and who is a distinguished scholar, you know, whose research has been really important in Brazil. For me, it's a great honor to introduce him here. Uh, 
uh, Professor Maxwell uh, taught at many universities, uh, such as Yale, Princeton, Columbia, and Harvard, where he was the founding director of the Brazil Studies Program at David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. He also served on several boards of foundations regarding to Latin America. He is the author of many remarkable monograph books, such as Conflicts and Conspiracies, Brazil and Portugal, 1750, uh, 1808, uh, which I prefer, Adevassa da Devassa, such amazing book. If the, it was an uh, in-person uh, colloquium, I will ask you for an autograph, but it's here next time. Uh, and also an important book about Marquis Pombal. Today, uh, he will talk about an Atlantic history, Brazil, France, and the United States of America, 1776 to 1792. Professor Maxwell, please. Thanks, thanks very much. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be even um, um, uh, virtually in Chicago at the Newbury Library. Um, where I see Ambassador Bello said it was 52 years ago, which makes me feel very ancient, but uh, it was a marvelous year and was, as you see, very much involved in, in what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, um, uh, Daniel Green and Ambassador Belly for the uh, organizing this. Uh, and Kelleen and Mary for the uh, su support they've given me in, uh, in this um, last few weeks in, in getting it here today. And I'd also like to thank Gabriel Paquette for his very um, kind words about um, uh, the last, uh, the, the first um, uh, go, um, Newbury seminar where in 68, where there were an, an amazing group of young scholars embarking on their careers. It, it's very interesting to think that um, the, the market for academics uh, was not very good at that period, and many of those scholars didn't find jobs, actually. So um, we have to remember that that was a, a remarkable period of, of, of hope, actually. You were talking early on about hope and scholarship, and uh, we have to re re remember that there were many young scholars, particularly of Brazil, of uh, colonial Brazil in particular, um, that didn't find jobs and disappeared from the field. But 68 was a moment of hope of young people coming together and uh, having a marvelous, uh, marvelous experience. Um, in 1789, a Republican constitutionalist and anti-colonial rebellion was planned in Brazil. The conspiracy occurred in Minas Gerais, at the time the most important region of Portugal's vast intercontinental overseas territories. Minas Gerais was called the soul of Portuguese empire in America by Martinho de Maduro Castro, uh, uh, sorry, Maduro Castro, uh, the Secretary of State for the Overseas Dominions in 1788. <clears throat> Minas Gerais was the source of vast wealth in gold and diamonds. The would-be insurgents in Brazil took their inspiration from the successful war of American independence from Great Britain and the establishment of the United States of America. This is an Atlantic history that links North America, Europe, and Brazil between the years 1776 and 78, and 1789-92 in a complex history of the transatlantic tr transmission of ideas and constitutional models. It joins the nation-building experiments in North America to the new constitutional republic, the conspirators in Minas, imagined they could build in Brazil in 1789. At the center of this republic was a book in French, which in English, the title was the collection of the constitutional laws of the English colonies, confederated under the title of the United States of America, to which is appended the Declaration of Independence of Confederation and other acts of general Congress translated from English and dedicated to Mr. Dr. Franklin, published in 1778. <clears throat> I was able to identify, could we see the second slide? Um, I was able to identify um, a copy. This, this is me in the vault at the Newbury Library doing my research in uh, 1968. 
which I, I had a, it was a marvelous uh, place where I could have all the books uh, around me. Perhaps we can have the next slide. Uh, and this uh, was, I was able to identify uh, this text, uh, which was published supposedly in Philadelphia in the rare book collection of the Newbury Library. Uh, while I was in Newbury Library, Gulbenkian visiting fellow during the year 68, 69. And I published this facsimile, facsimile of the title page in, uh, of the Newbury's Reque in my Princeton doctoral dissertation uh, in September 69. <clears throat> the Minas conspiracy took place between the American Revolution of 1776 and the adoption in 1789 of the Constitution of the United States. This was the same year as the outbreak of the French Revolution. The constitutional, constitutional influences on the would-be insurgents in Minas Gerais came from the early constitutions of the newly independent North American states that confederated in 1776. These North American constitutional models provoked much discussion in France between 1776 and 1789. And it was via France that these ideas and the models of constitutional innovation reached Brazil. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, key participants in the declaration of the independence of the United States in Philadelphia in 1776, both served as envoys from the United States to the court of the French King Louis XVI during and after the, the, the peace treaty of 1783, whereby Britain recognized American independence. Benjamin Franklin was the American envoy from 1776 until 1785, and Thomas Jefferson from 1785 to 1789. Benjamin Franklin, could we have the next slide, please? Uh, Benjamin Franklin was instrumental in the publication of the Requet in 1778, and it was the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, as was the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Comte de Vergennes. <clears throat> the Requet de Loi Constitutive des États-Unis de, de l'Amérique contained the foundational constitutional documents of the United States of America. The Declaration of Independence, a first draft of the Articles of Confederation, a census of the English colonies in 1775, a Navigation Act, the honorary doctoral degree awarded to General George Washington by Harvard University, and the constitutions of six of the 13 original American states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina, with additional documents concerning South Carolina and Boston. These constitutions were revolutionary documents. The first written constitutions, which sought to define the role of state power and individual liberty within legally defined and enforceable rules of conduct and constraint. The Portuguese governor of Minas Gerais, the Visconde de Babacena, discovered that a copy of the Requet was in the hands of the Minas conspirators in 1788-89 in Vila Rica, and that it informed the model for the independent, republican, and constitutional government they attended to establish after Portuguese rule was overthrown. The Visconde de Barbacena had was first informed. Could we have the next slide, please? Uh, the, this, this is the Visconti de Barbacena, who was first informed of the planned uprising on March the 14th, 1789, when Colonel Joaquim Silveri dos Reis denounced the Minas conspiracy to him. Silveri dos Reis was a major landowner, militia commander, and slave owner, and was the contractor of the tax form, farms of Minas Gerais. Joachim Silveri just raised, made his denunciation in person to Barbacena at Cachoeira do Campo, the governor's country residence four leagues to the northeast of Villa Rica. Barbacena found himself dangerously exposed, especially because of the involvement of senior officers of the, of the Minas Dragoons in the plot and the participation of leading lawyers, magistrates, and landowners. He used the month between the arrest of Tiradentes in Rio de Janeiro on May the 10th, 1789, and the arrest of the major, of the major conspirators in Minas Gerais on June 12th, 1789,
to strengthen the Portuguese party in Minas. This allowed time for the quiet deployment by the Viceroy from Rio de Janeiro to Vila Rica of a squadron of 300 cavalry from the Viceroy's own bodyguard, which arrived in Vila Rica on the 24th of June, as well as, well as 200 infantry for the Portuguese regiments of Maura and Braganza. These troops arrived in Vila Rica on July the 3rd, 1789. Two special courts of inquiry into the Minas conspiracy, de Vassas, were set up and conducted by the Portuguese authorities in Brazil in 1789 and 1790. These de Vassas were a series of judicial interrogations conducted by magistrates supported by the Viceroy of Brazil and by the governor of Minas. In 1791, a further de Vassa was conducted in Rio de Janeiro by judges sent from Lisbon as a special visiting tribunal, or Alçada. Barbacena had previously recommended to the Viceroy that the whole matter be dealt with without formal legal inquiry, and that those involved in the Minas conspiracy be removed from Minas Gerais and from Brazil, as he said, without great display, either attributing the cause to some other crime or saying nothing at all on the question. But Barbacena misjudged his uncle, and the Viceroy was his uncle's, reaction. The Viceroy had been a member of Portugal's highest court, and unlike most Viceroys of colonial Brazil who were military men, Luis de Vasconcelos de Souza was a former high court judge. Fortuitously for the Portuguese authorities, they were able to hide the Minas conspiracy from international attention. In 1789, the attention of the world was focused on the dramatic developments in Paris. Furthermore, in 1789, the United States was hoping to negotiate a commercial treaty with Portugal. Between 1783 and 1786, negotiations took place in Paris between the Portuguese and Benjamin Franklin first and later with Thomas Jefferson. In late March 86, 1786, Jefferson arrived in London from Paris and together with John Adams, the US envoy in the British capital, <clears throat> They negotiated a, pre, a, a preliminary commercial treaty with the Portuguese ambassador in London, Luis Pinto de Souza Coutinho, at his residence at Golden Square. Could we have the second, uh, the next uh, slide, please? Uh, these are the, uh, the, the American negotiators of the peace treaty with uh, Britain. Uh, can we have the next slide? And this is uh, Jefferson and John Adams, uh, who met with uh, Souza Coutinho. Uh, in London. Can we have the next slide, please? And uh, the, the preliminary treaty was signed by John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. This is a copy of it on the, April the 24th, 1786. Um, this is only exists in the Portuguese archives. There is no record whatsoever of this treaty uh, in the US archives. Uh, but the treaty, despite the signatures of Adams and jo Jefferson, as you see here, uh, was never approved in Lisbon. The Americans had always wanted access to Brazil, a demand that the Portuguese totally rejected. Jefferson, however, in 1785, re re recommended a defensive league between Portugal and the United States in defense of American shipping in the Mediterranean against pirates from Morocco, Algiers, Tripoli, and Tunis. And in May 1786, Portugal's naval squadron was instructed by Lisbon to, quote, defend and protect American ships from harassment and attacks. Meanwhile, in Brazil, shortly before he was arrested on May the 10th, 1789, in Rio de Janeiro, Tiradentes, is aware that he was being followed, had given his copy of the Reque to a fellow junior officer in the Minas Dragoons to take back to Minas Gerais. But this copy was seized in Minas Gerais by the governor or the agents of the governor. And it formed the basis of the secret inquiry that uh, Eloisa just talked about, which was separate uh, from the Devasas. Despite the claim on the title page of the Reque that it was published in Philadelphia. <clears throat> could we have the next slide please? 
Uh, this is uh, Golden Square in London, where the, uh, the treaty was negotiated between Adams and Jefferson and Susan Coutinho. And the house, uh, which is on the left-hand side uh, there, uh, still exists. Most of the rest of the square was destroyed in the Second World War, but the actual house that uh, was the Portuguese legation uh, still exists. And there's a, there's a blue plaque on it uh, that uh, shows where, where it was. Um, despite the claim that uh, the Riquet was published in Philadelphia, it was in fact published in Paris with the clandestine support of the French government. It was dedicated to Benjamin Franklin, who had arrived in Paris in December of 1776 to represent the Continental Congress and to secure the support of France for the War of Independence from, from Britain. Benjamin Franklin, then 70 years of age, was famous as, the leading, as a leading figure in natural philosophy and a, problem, uh, and a prominent member of the so-called Republic of Letters. Franklin was well acquainted with leading figures of the French Enlightenment, and these included uh, the Comte Roche, Rochefoucauld d'Anville, who was a strong supporter of North Americans in their revolt against England, and who was a natural scientist, president of the Academy of Medicine, and a member of the Royal Academy of Science, uh, Sciences. And he had translated uh, many of the American documents that were published in the Riquet. In, in 2013, we published in Brazil an annotated and critical edition of this 1778 Riquet in Portuguese with Penguin and Copenhagen's letters. This was a collective effort which I was able to complete the project uh, with, a, with the essential scholarly collaboration of three of my students at Harvard University, Gabriel de Villez in Russia, Bruno Cavallo, and John Huffman. Gabriel is now the Vasco da Gama Professor of Portuguese Studies at Brown University. Bruno has returned to Harvard as Professor of Romance Languages. And John Huffman is the editor of the Benjamin Franklin Papers at Yale University. The edition was called the Livre de, de Tiradentes, the Book of Tiradentes. And Eloisa Starling and Junior Ferreira Furtado of the Federal University of Minas Gerais contributed an essential essay of analysis to the introductory text. The detailed analysis of the problems of translation and representation in the French text was done by Bruno, John, and, and Gabriel, and is the basis of my description uh, here. The Requet opens with a dedication to Franklin by the editor, by Claude Ragnier. Ragnier writes that the constitutional laws are, quote, one of the most beautiful monuments of the human knowledge and at the same time constitutes the purest democracy ever imagined. I think Eloise would be interested in, in that uh, introduction to the, uh, to the, um, uh, to the Riquet. Um, but they, they point out very important differences in the French text uh, from the original. The Declaration of Independence and of the Articles of Confederation as well as the state constitutions were strategically deployed by Franklin to construct the image of a cohesive confederation of fully functional governments, the better to secure loans and alliances with France and with other potential European countries. Franklin told the Committee of Secret Correspondence of the US Congress, quote, all of Europe is with us, our Articles of Confederation being by our means translated and published have given an appearance of consistency and firmness, and firmness to the American state and government that begins to make them considerable. Franklin said they were being read with rapture. The important documents published in the Riquet, the most important document published in the Riquet was the direct de Declaration of Independence. The de declaration lists the reasons for the actions of the Continental Congress. The, director, the, the, director, the de declaration was justified, um, was a justification by dependent colonies of the British Empire of their determination to become states independent of the empire and to be recognized as equal before the powers of earth. It asserted the unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness elicited the abuses and usurp usurpations of King George III. These facts, the declaration submitted to the candid world, 
as free and independent states. They have the right to levy war, conclude peace, conduct alliances, establish commerce, and do all the other acts and things which independent states have a right to do. The, Con the Con Confederation Congress replaced the Continental Congress after the approval of the Articles Confederation by the 30 North American states in 1781. The Congress was unicameral and each state had one vote. There was no executive, leadership was vested in congressional committees. Congress could establish diplomatic, diplomatic relations, make war and peace, request men and money from the states, coin and borrow money and regulate the state's relations with Native Americans. In Franklin's draft of the Articles of Confederation, which was published in the Red Cave, Congress possessed similarly limited authority. The order of the text in the Red Cave gave the impression of political unity and central direction, with the direction of independence and the Articles of Confederation coming first in the volume. Thus, the Congress appeared to, to initiate or approve the individual declarations and constitutions of the states. But in reality, several of the states had already adopted constitutions to replace their colonial charters before the Continental Congress assumed the role in the process by calling in May 1776 for the colonies to form new governments. The shift of, of the, from the future to the present tense in the French translation also transfigures a, no, a nation that was about to be created into one already established and proclaiming its own unity. Because the consistency and relatively uniformity among the constitutions, the appearance of unity was also apparent in the state constitutions, where the direct relations of rights paired with explicit commitments to democratic principles declares the government derives its authority from the people and is founded on a compact for the common good. Frequent elections would provide the mechanism by which the people would control and shape the government, as well as hold their representatives accountable. The fourth document in the Red K reproduces the honorary degree awarded to George Washington, commander of the Continental Army by Harvard University on April the 13th, 1776. <clears throat> It celebrated the fall of Boston to Washington's forces and the return of the faculty and students to their buildings. The Riquet mis mistakenly calls Harvard Harward and says it is the University of Cambridge in New England. The Riquet reproduces the, wor the wording of the decree in full. It eulogizes George Washington's valor in defense of the Republic in, and in saving the country from the dangers that threatened it. <coughs> Washington's degree is followed by six state constitutions. With, uh, and the Pennsylvania Constitution was the first, declaring the rights of the inhabitants of the Republic of Pennsylvania. All men are born equal and independent and have certain inalienable, natural, and essential rights to acquire property and to possess it and to seek uh, to obtain their happiness and security. The emphasis in the Reque on the need to check arbitrary government through the oversight of the principle was also evident in constitutional articles concerning the formation of militias. Standing armies for, were repudiated. The right to vote was guaranteed by all the state constitutions published in the Reque. The, the state constitutions also gave considerable attention to reinforcing the impartiality, integrity, and independence of the courts and judges and upheld the basic continuity of rights under English common law. They also provided protection against gruesome application of judicial power and provided protection against cruel and unusual punishment. Slavery is addressed in several of the constitutional documents in the Red Cave. The constitutions of Virginia, Pennsylvania, South Carolina and Delaware and the footnotes Franklin's footnotes to the Pennsylvania Constitution and the Declaration of Rights. Most prominent were protests against the British military recruitment of slaves to fight against their masters. In Virginia, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, Virginia constitutions all refer to this policy as one of the large, one of the largest sets of grievances justifying the rebellion against King George III. 
As far as the slave trade was concerned, the text of the Navigation Act included in the Reque differs substantially from the original by giving additional emphasis to the prohibition of the slave trade. In the Reque, the only constitution, only the constitution of Delaware made any provision for the abolition of slavery. The Venus conspirators owned two copies of the Reque. The Tyridentist copy claimed on its frontispiece to be published in, on Suisse. This was a pirated edition, but it was identical in all other respects to the Reque, which claimed on its frontispiece it was published in Philadelphia, which is the Reque that the Newbury Library uh, holds in its rare collection. Both editions of the Reque were in fact published in Paris. Two copies of the Reque were brought to Minas Gerais in 1788 by former Brazilian students at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, uh, one by José Alvarez and Maciel and the other by José Pereira Ribeiro. And I'm extremely interested in what um, Eloisa said about the second a copy um, potentially ending up uh, in Recife, uh, which is a very interesting um, uh, um, new addition, I think, to our knowledge. Um, the population of the English, 13 English colonies in 1776, as enumerated at the beginning of the Reque, numbered over 3 million. Virginia had the largest population, with 650,000. Massachusetts had 400,000. Pennsylvania, 350,000. North Carolina, 300,000. South Carolina, 225,000. The population of Brazil is estimated to have been over one and a half million in this period, of which Minas Gerais had the highest concentration with over 300,000 people. The population of Rio de Janeiro, Janeiro number 215,000, Bahia over 288,000, and Pernambuco 239,000. In both Brazil and in the 13 English colonies, the indigenous peoples were not excluded in the population figures. In Minas Gerais, blacks and people of mixed race outnumbered whites and composed 70% of the population. There were over 150,000 free blacks and mixed race people in Minas Gerais and over 160,000 black slaves. The leading participants in the Minas conspiracy were all slave owners. In this, they were much like Thomas Jefferson who owned 267 slaves in Virginia. In Minas, Joaquin Silveira dos Reis owned, owned over 200 slaves. Alvarengo Pichotto owned 132. Josi Aires Gomez, 123. Francisco Oliveira Lopez, 20, uh, 69. Father Correa de Toledo, uh, 32. Claudio Mano de Costa had 31 slaves. And Tiradentes owned five slaves. In 1782, slaves composed 47.7% of the population of Virginia. In Minas Gerais in 1786, slaves made up 47.9% of the population. Jefferson, Virginia was therefore much closer to Minas in this period than was Franklin's Pennsylvania. <clears throat> The Minas conspirators saw the American re re Revolution as relevant because they perceived the tax demands placed on them by Portugal as similar to those the British had attempted to, pose, to impose on their North American colonies. <clears throat> Visconti de, de Barbacena had arrived with a massive instructions of 132 paragraphs and only over 20 annexes. Uh, in, intended to reform the colonial administration in Minas Gerais. And the fall in gold returns, he had been told by Marilyn Castro, was a result of what he called the general relaxation of those charged with the inviolable observance of the laws. He had been ordered on his arrival in the Minas to call together the Junta de Fazenda of the Captaincy and to read the stipulations of the Alvar of the 3rd of December, 1750, by which the inhabitants of Minas had agreed to, to pay the royal exchequer a hundred aromas of gold per annum. He had to remind them that this, this quota was unfulfilled, that if this quota was unfulfilled, a per capita tax or a derama was to be imposed on all the inhabitants of the captaincy to make up for the unpaid arrears. These arrears in 1788 amounted to the staggering total 
of 538 arobas of gold. A roba is about 32 pounds weight. The payments under the Minas tax for farms were also in arrears. Barbacena was instructed to void all tax farms in Minas and to institute legal proceedings against the debtors of the Royal Treasury, quote, of whatever quality they may be. These tax demands appear to be similar to those Britain had attempted to impose on the colonies in North America. And the Minas conspirators saw the constitutional documents reproduced in the Requet as a framework to discuss the institutions they intended to create for their own independent Republican government with a constitutional structure. The initial interrogations of those arrested in Villa Rica, however, quickly revealed a direct connection between the Minas conspirators and Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of American Independence and the principal document reproduced in the Requet. During his interrogations, Colonel Francisco Antonio de Oliveira Lopez said that Dominguez Vidal de Barbosa had told him that, that a letter had been written to the Minister of the United States in Paris by a student at the University of Montpellier in France. In October 1786, Jefferson had received a letter in French signed with a pseudonym Vendek. The letter had been sent by a professor Francis, Francois Vigano of the University of Montpellier. Vigano was a prominent Freemason with links in Paris. Vendek in his letter to Jefferson wrote that he had a matter of great consequence to communicate, but that, that as he was a foreigner in France, he wished Jefferson to, rec to recommend a safe channel for correspondence. Jefferson did so. And in a second letter, Vendek declared himself to be a Brazilian, which I think is very interesting in relation to the previous discussion that we had. He told Jefferson that the slavery, is, this is a quote, the slavery in which his country lay was rendered each day more insupportable since the epoch of your glorious independence. Brazilians had decided to follow the example of the North Americans, he said, to break the chains that bound them to Portugal, to solicit the aid, to solicit the aid of the United States was the purpose of his visit to France. Nature made us inhabitants of the same continent, Vendek told Jefferson, and in consequence, in some degree, compatriots. The following year, when visiting the antiquities at Nîmes in southern France, Jefferson arranged a secret rendezvous with Vendek. When they met, the, the Brazilian told Jefferson that, the, that, quote, the Portuguese in Brazil are few in number, mostly married there and have lost sight of their native country and are disposed to become dependent. There are 20,000 regular troops. Originally, these were Portuguese, but as they have died off, they have been, re been replaced with natives, so that these compose the present the mass of the troops and may be counted on by their native country. The officers are partly Portuguese, partly Brazilian. The men of letters are those most desirous of a revolution. In fact, on the question of a revolution, there is but one mind in that country. What was needed, Vendek told Jefferson, was the support of a powerful nation. Jefferson writing from Marseille on May the 4th, 1787 to John Jay, Secretary of Foreign Affairs to the, of the Confederation, uh, reported in detail of his, on his conversation with Vendek. This is a quote from Jefferson. They consider the North American Revolution to be a precedent for theirs. They look to the United States as most likely to give them honest support and for a variety of considerations have the strongest prejudices in our favor. Apparently Rio de Janeiro, Minas Gerais and Bahia would instigate the uprising and other captaincies were expected to follow their example. The royal revenue from the fifth of gold production and diamonds, as well as the rest of the gold production could be counted on. They have an abundance of horses. They would want cannon, ammunition, ships, sailors, soldiers and officers for which they are disposed to look to the United States, always understood that every service and furniture will be, paid, will be well paid. They, had want us at all they would want from us at all times corn and salt fish. Portugal being without either army or navy would not attempt an invasion under the 12 month. Considering of what it would be composed, it would probably never attempt a second. Indeed, this source of their well-being intercepted, they are scarcely capable of the first effort 
the meanest door, door are among mountains and accessible to any army. Special Mutual Master, a, a sorry for interrupt you, but we just have a short time, so we also need some time for have some questions. So okay. If you can conclude, please. Yeah, the uh, the the Rakei, uh, which had been seized by Baba Sena, um, was lost for many years, but was rediscovered. Uh, I mean, was uh, then uh, uh, given uh, by the director of the uh, the archive uh, to the public library uh, in Santa Catarina, um, and then in 1984, Tancredo Neves, the governor of Minas. Uh, who found out that it was in um, Santa Catarina, asked uh, for it to be returned uh, to Minas, which it was um, in 1789. Um, I'd just like to finish uh, with a description of the um, an analysis I made of the content of the... Um, so could we have some... Uh, go through some more slides, please. Yeah, go, go further on, yeah, further on, further on, further, further, further. Yeah, here, yeah. back back one. Yeah, so here I am examining the uh, the um, uh, Red K. Um, the interesting thing is there are annotations on the, uh, on the, the, um, the Red K. Um, in ink and in pencil. I thought for a time that the pencil ones were probably done later, uh, but um, the document that the Newbury Library bought um, of the um, diaries of Luis de Albuquerque, uh, from, who, who was the governor of Mato Grosso, I actually identified those for Richard Raymer, who was the uh, rare bookseller, uh, who, um, um, the Newbury must have uh, bought the copies from him, I would guess. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the, what they show is that the annotations are mainly on the constitution of Pennsylvania. Uh, and they, there's a very large footnote there, there the Pennsylvania, uh, which was written by Benjamin Franklin on the definition of slavery, free men, and so on um, in, in Brazil. So we have from this a view of what we have the, 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 the examples of the interrogations, but these were always suspect in terms of people were trying to hide things rather than reveal things. But the annotations which were made in late 1788 and early 1789, uh, while they were expecting the drama and the rebel revolt to take place, uh, are very revealing um, as, to, as to what um, uh, the new constitutional republic uh, that the Minas conspirators were thinking of in, in 1789. This was the Society of Thought, a Sociedad de Pensamento that uh, Eloisa um, uh, and uh, Junio Furtado talked about in their introduction to the to our edition of the Libro uh, de Tiridentes. Um, Tiridentes, of course, was the only conspirator. Most of the conspirators were exiled to Africa. He was the only one uh, who was. Um, hanged, uh, his head was cut off, his body was cut into four pieces that were distributed uh, into, on the roads into Minas Gerais, and his head was taken into Minas and put on a pole in the central square. If we can see the final uh, illustration here, the final slide uh, here, uh, the, where, where Tiridense's head was put on the display uh, in front of the which was the then the municipal uh, um, uh, house of the uh, residents of the prison here uh, in order of prayer. Um, and the, the irony is the Pennsylvania Constitution, which had very much inspired the Constitutional Republic, the meanest conspirators uh, had um, envisioned. Uh, was so radical that it was very much um, 
revise very quickly um, at just the moment uh, when the Tyridentus was uh, being uh, executed. Um, and, uh, so this is, I'm afraid I haven't been able to talk about much of the, uh, the substance of this, um, but this was an Atlantic history that joined North America, France and Brazil at the exact moment, 1789, um, at, the, at the height, if you like, uh, of the age of revolution. It was a Brazilian constitutional republic imagined in 1789, but lost in 1789. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Maxwell. And sorry for interrupting you, but I just did that. No, to let no, some no. time for our questions. Uh, so, uh, time for questions, comments. Kevin, do you have something? No, no, no. Mm. I have a question for uh, Eloisa. I'm very interested in what you said about the uh, the other copy. So you interested in que was it is sobre outra copia de Reque que pode ser descoberto em Recife? I have a question about the other copy that you mentioned that came up in Recife. That was extremely interesting for the idea of democracy and the changes that came after the French Revolution, before the French Revolution and the popular engagement specifically in in the province of Salvador and the province of Recife. Uh, this change in the, in, the, in the profile of pictures that became involved politically. So Salvador in particular has a very strong um, political uh, change in the profile of the, those involved. Thank you very much for your comment. What do I do here? Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Thank you, Kenneth. Oi, tá me ouvindo? Sim. Isso. Então, é, eu também, porque quando quando yes, I feel the same way. When you talked about the research, when you wrote the Tira Dentist uh, book, the one that was published by Penguin, I thought that was fascinating, but I wasn't thinking about that. Then if Valdo Cabral, the historian, pushed me to research that. And he said, no, there was another one. And that's when we thought of Bustamante. That was, Valdo found out about the second book. I was his researcher and I traced it. I followed the clues left by Bustamante. We thought that Bustamante had being in Recife, that he was a political leader in the revolution and in the establishment of the constitutional project of Recife, of the 17 revolution. And then he was also in Mina. So I started my research and noticed that he was there as well. So that thing that you found out, Kenneth, when you try to frame the, 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 the time in which the, the my, Mina's conspiracy happened. You will analyze that. You remember, you mentioned that Bustamante was there. He was at the present that oath. So there's a great chance that this is what happened. What we don't have, and I probably need to do more research to try to figure out is more information about Bustamante in the United States when he left his seat, when he left Brazil, where did he go in the US? And perhaps that way we might be able to establish a stronger connection, the stronger connection that I tried to establish here. But what you mentioned in your book about how important the authentic ideas are, 
the, 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 the journey of these two books show us that I learned that from you, from your perspective, when you talk about the, the waves of the Atlantic bringing and taking ideas across the Americas. So it's, it's interesting to, to understand how it uh, disseminated around Brazil. You have, and it changes uh, in, for, for example, the idea of, of a patriota. Bruno Carvalho found something phenomenal, which is the first flag of the Minas conspiracy was created by Claudio Manuel da Costa. And he wanted to write on the flag uh, a pamphlet of Sydney, who was the main pamphleteer in the English Revolution in 1640, who was an idol of the revolutionary thought that arrived in Minas. And Claudio Manuel Costa uses that pamphlet. And he says, oh, this is inspired in that uh, pamphlet. Maybe he wanted to add that because he read the pamphlet. Or maybe Thomas Jefferson's uh, steel, he also used the Sydney's pamphlet for his own steel. Uh, but, no, but notice what Bruno found out. Watch how these ideas are moved around. And these people think that just because they have the internet, the news move faster. But back then, news was disseminated fast too, with or without the internet. Yes, it's fantastic. Bruno is a great researcher. I hope he comes back. He is, he is a genius, genius. He's very good. And this new discovery is amazing. He was able to connect the English Revolution, the most radical time in the English Revolution, the most important pamphlet year in 1640 with the you are with the American Revolution and Minas, Claudio Manuel in Minas. It is exceptional. That is an amazing history. You gotta give credit, but credit is deserved. Claudio's uh, story is very, very interesting. Uh, I think there was a murder. He knows everything about everything. I agree, I agree. Yes, they have a lot of the stories from, uh, short stories from Rodrigo Macedo too. He's very auspicious. It is a beautiful novel. I don't know if you read it. And if you didn't, send me your email address or your address and I'll send it to you. There's a Brazilian writer called Silviano Santiago. Yes, I know him. He has the, the novel In Liberdade, in which he established that connection between Claudio Moreira Costa and the interpreter Mist, whoever it was, the, the, their death. And he says, I feel so anxious. What is this, this pain in my heart? What questions that, that I have in my heart that I don't think Claudio Moreira Costa actually committed suicide? So I feel like we can repeat what Silviano Santiago said. What question is it that we have within us that make us question that Claudio Moreira Costa actually committed suicide? And I'm pretty sure he was assassinated as well. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yes, they burned all the documents after he was murdered before uh, everyone else was um, incarcerated. Well, thank you, Eloisa. Thank you, Kenneth. I will have to be that bad person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't have time. We would love that, but we don't have time. So uh, thank you all so much. Uh, and if, if you would like to say some final words, no, I'd like to thank you everybody again and say that it was a great pleasure to me to be here, to uh, meet you all and spend this wonderful afternoon here at Newberry, virtual, but Newberry. Well, it's a great, great pleasure to see you all. It's a marvelous, for me, it's a marvelous pleasure after 52 years to be back in the Newberry. So, great pleasure. Thank you very much. Muito obrigada, Elisa. Desculpa essa conversa. Thank you, Elisa. My apologies for this 
quick conversation between historians here. You put us all together. You know you that's all you can expect from us. Gabriel, João Paulo, would you like to say some final words? Nothing except to say thank you. It was a, I, I learned quite a lot um, from my fellow panelists, and um, I do wish we were together in Chicago to continue the conversation over dinner. So, but uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Just the same. It was a real pleasure to be in touch with you and to share this very interesting session. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Oh, thank you, and it's really nice because we have for one more colloquium now. So, <laughs> so let's go now to Newberry now to listen to the uh, final words to the closure of this uh, wonderful symposium. Benoni, please. Hello. Let's yes. unmute here. So uh, final words of, of thanks as well. Uh, it's been an honor to be here among such distinguished scholars live from the new Barry. Uh, I would have wished to have you all here, but uh, with the pandemic, it was not possible, but it was good to listen to this interesting and rich perspectives on the Brazilian history. It was uh, no doubt a brilliant way to kick off our countdown to the celebration of the bicentennial of, our, of Brazil's independence. And our political, economic, and social history carefully discussed here uh, today by Gabriel Paquetti, João Pimenta, Eloisa Stalin, and Kenneth Maxwell brings us an inspiring overview of the Brazilian social and cultural foundations, as well as uh, political identities and other aspects of our trajectory as a country. And I also thank uh, our moderator, Elisa Garcia, for the wonderful job and for being able to manage the time. I, I know that is a very hard uh, task. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank uh, the New Barry Library for its contribution to draw the attention of the scholars and the public to this crucial debate about our past and its impact on our collect collective effort to take stock of Brazil's challenges and achievements as we approach the bicentennial. Finally, uh, I uh, need to recognize also my friend Rogério de Souza Farias who is following this uh, event uh, from Brasilia. He was the one who gave me the idea for the first time to organize this. And he is the reason why, I, why I, I asked the meeting with the president of Newberry right after arriving here. So thank you Rogério for the idea. And this is also um, part of your effort to make history more known among Brazilians. Thank you. So, what is... so I think we finish our job today. So congratulations, everybody. Oh, and the book's coming soon. Oh, so, bye, everybody.